All right, what's up guys? So today we're gonna do a cram session for your family medicine shelf or for the family medicine component of your um, step two CK. So, or for anyone who's just interested in listening to family medicine knowledge. So first, we're gonna talk about triple A, abdominal aortic aneurysm. When do you start doing screening for that? So it's in people age 65, and if they've ever smoked, you're gonna do an abdominal ultrasound for a triple A. What about for lung cancer screening? So anyone who's 55 years or older with a 30 pack year history of, of smoking, who currently smokes, or who, or if they have quit within 15 years. If they meet for any of those criteria, then you're gonna do a low dose CT scan of the chest for lung cancer. So meanwhile, I'm gonna take this opportunity to give you guys a little bit of advice. For the family medicine shelf, make sure you review the USPSTF guidelines, the A and B rated ones. These ones, if you know them really well and review them, you can search it online. It'll help you a lot. A lot of these questions are based off your knowledge of the guidelines. All right, so next is colonoscopy. You, you do a colonoscopy for uh, colon cancer screening starting at 50 years old and you do it every 10 years. If they have someone in the family who was diagnosed with colon cancer before age 60, then you're gonna screen at 40 years old or 10 years before the family member got diagnosed with colon cancer, whatever comes first. So say um, someone in your family had colon cancer at 45, then you wanna start colon, uh, colon cancer screening at 35. But say someone in your family got diagnosed at 60, 10 before that is 50, so you will pick 40 years old because that one came first. Pap smears start at age 21 years old and happen every three years. You can stop at age 65. Mammograms, um, USPSTF and ACOG, which is the OBGYN society, used to argue about this, but lately I've been noticing that there's more of a consensus now and it's 40 years old starting at 40 years old and every year or two. When do you start screening for osteoporosis? 65 years old and you're going to use a DEXA scan of the lumbar spine. You want to give the zoster vaccine at 60 years old. You want to give the HPV vaccine between 9 to 26 years old. Chlamydia and gonorrhea screening occurs in females who are sexually active and less than 24 years old. HIV screening is done for anyone between ages 15 and 65. And so those are your major um, screenings and you should definitely try and commit this to memory. So next is COPD. There's mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. And how you categorize it depends on the FEV1. And the FEV1, is also the main metric for prognosis. If you have a very low FEV1, then your prognosis is poor. So it starts with above 80%, 50 to 80, 30 to 50, and less than 30. So if it's your FEV1 is over 80%, you're gonna give someone with COPD albuterol, which is a short acting beta agonist. Between 50 to 80, which is moderate, you're gonna add a long acting beta agonist, such as salmeterol. Between 30 to 50, you want to add an inhaled steroid. Below 30, which is very severe, this is when you start adding oxygen therapy. There's also um, two other metrics that you can use for when patients will start needing oxygen therapy at home, and that's if your O2 saturation is less than 88 or your PaO2 is less than 55. So for gout, Gout is basically, the classic presentation is acute abrupt onset of severe pain of the metatarsophalangeal joint of the foot, which is the at the base of your big toe. That part will become swollen and really red and extremely painful, so painful that it might even wake the patient up in the middle of the night. Inside 
this joint is going to be filled with uric acid crystals, which are negatively birefringent. And the first thing you always want to do with the hot swollen joint is aspiration. So when you do the joint aspiration, that's where you'll find the uric acid crystals. Remember, the positively birefringent crystals are also known as pseudogout, and those are the ones that have the calcium pyrophosphate crystals, and they will be rhomboid shaped. So for gout, you have a couple treatments. For acute gout, you want your first line is you want to treat with an NSAID such as indomethacin or colchicine. If you had to pick one or the other, pick indomethacin first. But here's a trick. If the patient has any sort of kidney disease where their um, GFR is really low or their creatinine is high, if they have CKD, then these drugs are contraindicated and you want to proceed instead with the intra-articular steroid injection. Like I said, any hot swollen joint needs to be aspirated because we fear of septic arthritis and if that's untreated, it can be deadly, but it can also destroy the joint very quickly. Someone with septic arthritis commonly happens in the knee or the hip, and it's secondary to systemic infections such as bacteremia, and this person will have an extremely tender, swollen joint that's really red, and they won't be able to bear weight either on the hip or be able to bend the knee at all. Very severe pain, and they'll also have fever and leukocytosis. So the first thing you want to do is arthrocentesis, take it out. And when you analyze the joint fluid, you'll see that usually a septic joint will have over 50,000 white blood cells. Inflammatory joints are usually between 10 to 50,000. And that's more kind of like gout or like rheumatoid arthritis. And then septic joint will have 90% plus neutrophils. And then with that, you want to treat with IV antibiotics. So for gout meds that you want to use for chronic treatment of gout and preventing future flares, you can either treat with probenicid or allopurinol. So in order to know how which one to use, you can check the uric acid in the urine. So basically, if the urine uric acid is low, then that means that there's a problem with excreting uric acid. So you want to use probenicid, which helps improve excretion. And then allopurinol, which is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, which uh, prevents the formation of uric acid, is used if the urine uric acid is really high. That means that the body is making so much uric acid and it's spilling out into the urine. So this is an excess production problem, not an under excretion problem. So then you can use allopurinol. But for <clears throat> acute flares, you always start off first line with the NSAID. Don't use, pick the more long-term types of treatments such as allopurinol because that makes it worse in the short term. So initial prenatal care, the first you should know about what type of things you wanna work up for the first initial visit, the visit at week around week 28, and the visit at around week 35 to 37. So the first visit, you want to always do a CBC, a urinalysis, STD, HIV, hepatitis B, a pap smear, blood typing, and rubella. At weeks 28, you check for three things, the CBC to check for anemia, and then diabetes screening, and then the Rogram shot if they're RH negative. So diabetes screening, remember, you start off with the 50 gram oral glucose, and after one hour, if that's greater than 140, then you advance to the next stage, which is the 100 gram glucose load, and then that you measure at hours one, two, and three. If it's high in two out of the three hours, then you diagnose gestational diabetes. So at hours one, it should be greater than 180, and then hours two is greater than 160, and hour three is greater than 140. 180, 160, 140. And it can be plus or minus that. Some different sources give other numbers, but usually in a question, if they wanna make it clear, it'll be way above those uh, values. Like So hours one, two, and three, if two, out of the three are high in the 100 gram, then that's gestational diabetes. 
So you want to check that at week 28. And then the roll gam shot, if the mom is RH negative, and remember the reason why you give the roll gam shot is it's an antibody that prevents the fetal red blood cells from being detected by mom's immune system. Because if she sees those baby's red blood cells that are possibly RH positive, then her antibodies might switch from IgM to IgG, and that's bad news for the second baby. And then, and finally, in week 35 to 37, that's when you do the group B strep uh, test of and do a swab of the vagina and rectal area and the perianal area, because if they show up for having a positive group B strep, then that's when you give penicillin prophylaxis four hours before delivery. For pap smears, starting at age 21, you're gonna do them every three years, and then there's three types of outcomes with the pap smear. It can be ascus, low grade, or high grade. And ascus means atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance. If you have ascus, then the next thing you wanna do is an HPV test. If that's positive, then you proceed to a colposcopy. But if the mom is pregnant during the pap smear and she has ascus, then you basically take your chances and do the pap after birth because it's not likely she'll have cancer. If it's low grade or high grade, um, as an LSIL or HSIL, then you're gonna proceed with a colposcopy. Once you do the colposcopy, that's when you do use the speculum and view the cervix under microscopy and then biopsy the lesions. This can come back as CIN1 two and three if it's cancerous then that's when you proceed with uh, doing a hysterectomy for pap smears remember every three years and end at 65 years old the tdap vaccine is something that's given during pregnancy and that happens between weeks 27 to 36. any live vaccines will have to wait until after the baby is born term is considered Anything starting at 37 weeks and post-term is starting at 42 weeks. All right, so pediatric milestones. It's hard to remember anything, like all of it, but here are some of the key ones you should try to remember. So at two months, the baby can lift their head off the ground in prone position. And then at four months, the baby can roll over. At six months, the baby can sit up on their own. At nine months, the baby can crawl or cruise. Cruising meaning they can kind of get up and walk, but they need to use the couch as like a crutch and they're gonna be using the couch to like keep themselves propped up. And then at 12 months, the baby can use one to three words other than mama and dada. Two years old can has hundreds of words that they know, two zeros and two word phrases. At three years old, thousands of words, three zeros, and three word phases. At five years old, you can dress yourself and write your own name. At six years old, you can tie your shoes and identify left and right. And also remember that in terms of like vision and hearing testing, audiometry should start at four years old and same with vision testing. It should start around that age as well. If a kid is really young and they're cross-eyed, you want to make sure that they go to the eye doctor because any early onset of strabismus can cause a kid to be at increased risk for amblyopia, which basically means that their whatever eye is not focused, is not getting enough uh, stimulation to the visual cortex, and this can lead to blindness. So you want to make sure that any kid who has strabismus or a congenital cataract needs to have... Um, vision testing, and see an ophthalmologist. At six months old, the babies can start using toothpaste. They can also start visiting the dentist by one year old. Breastfeeding happens exclusively until six months, and then you can start introducing solids. The first flu shot happens at six months. The first live vaccine happens at one years old, and that's the MMR vaccine. If someone has constantly a runny nose, due to allergies, 
The first line treatment is intranasal steroids. The main side effect of intranasal steroids you should be aware of is epistaxis because the steroids can cause atrophy of the mucosa, which predisposes to bleeding. Anything of a hemoglobin less than seven needs to be needs transfusion. Remember this. What's the most common cause of folate deficiency? Alcohol abuse. So if someone has acute gastroenteritis with hematochesia, aka bloody diarrhea, what's the next step? Stool analysis to check for white blood cells. If there are white blood cells present, this confirms that it's an inflammatory diarrhea. Meanwhile, any type of gastroenteritis, make sure to rehydrate. Yeah, make sure just to keep them hydrated with oral or IV fluids. If they're hypotensive, then IV fluids. If they're normotensive, then you can give oral rehydration therapy, which is just glucose and salt together. Be aware of the main common culprits of inflammatory diarrhea, and that's Campylobacter, EHAC, Salmonella, Shigella, and Yersinia. Most of the time, these are treated with supportive care, and you only give antibiotics if the patient is really young or immunosuppressed or very elderly. Other than that, if you're an immunocompetent person, you don't want to treat with antibiotics. And definitely, you don't want to treat uh, the diarrhea with antidiarrheals such as loperamide because that traps in the bacteria and can make things worse. By promoting diarrhea or letting it pass, then the patient can excrete out all of the bacteria. Remember, one of the main complications is with EHEC, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. If you give someone antibiotics such as the fluoroquinolone, this can, pro can progress to hemolytic uremic syndrome, which leads to anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal failure. And you don't want that to happen. If it does happen, then you would treat it with dialysis. If someone has chronic diarrhea, means diarrhea lasting for greater than a month, then you want to do a stool, ova, and parasite analysis. C. diff is Clostridium difficile. It's a type of diarrhea that can happen most likely after taking broad spectrum antibiotics. It's also classically associated with clindamycin use. And this, to diagnose this, um, first the clinical signs will be diarrhea and abdominal pain after taking antibiotics. They might even have fever and leukocytosis. But you wanna do a toxin A and B analysis of the stool. And then if it's confirmed that they have C. diff, you want to treat with oral vancomycin because if you give it IV, it won't have good enough penetration to the colon. So if you give it orally, it's more active in the colon. So remember the two most common causes of viral watery diarrhea are norovirus and rotavirus. These two in the vignette will usually be associated with cruise ships or classrooms. So make sure if you see someone who has like a viral watery diarrhea with vomiting and diarrhea with acute onset and they were on a cruise or in areas close to other people such as classrooms, this is noro or rotavirus and the kids should stay home until that illness is resolved. Also rotavirus is common in the winter. For osteoporosis, when you do the DEXA scan at 65 years old, the result will have a T-score. If it's less than negative 2.5, if it's below that, that's diagnosed as osteoporosis. Between negative 1 and 2.5 is considered osteopenia. What's the first line treatment of osteoporosis? It's bisphosphonates, such as alendronate. All right, next is MSK injuries. So, so you're gonna need to know the indications for an x-ray of an ankle when someone rolls it. And this follows the Ottawa ankle rules. So you wanna do an x-ray if there's posterior malleolar tenderness or inability to bear weight immediately after injury. Any of those two, and it's an indication for an x-ray of the ankle. So hematuria is, remember sometimes it can you can have microscopic hematuria, which means it's invisible to the naked eye, or proteinuria. If this is the first time it's been detected on a urine dipstick, 
Then the next step is to repeat the urinalysis. But with the repeat, this time it should have a microscopic analysis because with the microscopic analysis, this can be more specific red blood cell casts or if there are dysmorphic red blood cells. So the microscopic analysis can give more information. And then one of the key mysteries of a urinalysis is sometimes you'll have a urinalysis that has a lot of blood on dipstick, but no red blood cells. So what is that? Something that has a lot of blood, but no red blood cells is usually pathognomonic for rhabdomyolysis because rhabdomyolysis will have myoglobin, which gets released and the myoglobin is detected as blood. So for thyroid disorders, remember the first line drugs you can use for hyperthyroidism are methimazole and propyl thyrouracil. And the main side effect I want you to remember is it can cause agranulocytosis, which means a deficiency of granulocytes. And remember granulocytes are your basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils, and these will be down. And so if the patient, a hyperthyroid patient who's being treated with this comes in with a sore throat or signs of infection, then the most likely culprit is due to these medications causing agranulocytosis. So remember, if a patient is pregnant, that the thyroid hormone she's taking, if she's hypothyroid and she's taking levothyroxine, then with pregnancy, the levothyroxine dose should be increased because when your estrogen levels are very high, the thyroid binding globulin levels increase a lot. And this kind of, you can think of it as it kind of like sucks up all the ex sucks up all the medication and then binds to it. And then basically you're going to need more uh, thyroid hormone to replace it. And also it's always better for the mom to be a little bit hyperthyroid rather than euthyroid or hypothyroid because hypothyroidism in pregnancy can cause cretinism, which is congenital hypothyroidism. And this can be devastating for the kid's development. So next is a thyroid nodule. The next step that you should do is a TSH level and an ultrasound. So basically you wanna do an ultrasound to assess for the nodule to see how many nodules there are, get some information, look at it to see if it's cystic or if it looks cancerous and also to measure the size. The TSH will help you determine if they're hyperthyroid or euthyroid. If the TSH is low, it means they're hyperthyroid. Most of the times, thyroid nodules that are hyperthyroid, aka a hot nodule, usually they are not malignant. But the cold nodules, aka the ones that are euthyroid, are the ones that are most likely to be malignant. So if someone is hyperthyroid with a thyroid nodule, the next step after that is you want to do a radioactive iodine uptake. And then from there, if it's a diffuse uptake, this is Graves disease. If it is taken up in one area, then that's called a toxic adenoma. And if it's taken up in multiple patchy areas, that's called a multinodular goiter, which is multiple toxic adenomas. If they have Graves disease, then you can treat with PTU and methimazole and see if it goes away. And if they have a toxic adenoma or multinodular goiter, then you can do a radioactive iodine therapy, which basically ablates the toxic thyroid nodules. If there's a cold nodule, AKA it's not hyperthyroid, and the nodule is greater than one centimeter, then you wanna do a biopsy of that lesion, a fine needle aspiration, and to assess to see if it's cancerous or not. If it's less than a centimeter, then you can follow up in six months. After the biopsy and it's cancerous, then the next step is surgical removal. For fetal heart rate tracings, remember for the fetal heart rate, normal is between 110 and 160. If the fetal heart rate is above 160 for fetal tachycardia, that means that the mom has an infection. If the fetal heart rate is sinusoidal, this means that the baby has anemia. If the baby has a complete heart block, then most likely mom has lupus. And then in terms of 
accelerations, you want to know that a good acceleration is a sign that the baby is healthy. And to define acceleration is the 15 and 15, 2 and 20 rule, which means if the heart rate raises by 15 and lasts for at least 15 seconds, and you see two of those in 20 minutes, that means the baby is healthy and it rules out hypoxia. A non-stress test, which is done when mom feels like there's reduced movement in the baby, then you do a non-stress test and that's where you check for accelerations. If you don't see any accelerations, the 15 in 15, 2 and 20, then you proceed to a biophysical profile, which incorporates more elements such as breathing, tone, movement, and like amniotic fluid volume. And if the score for that is less than four, then you want to deliver. But for now, just remember what an acceleration is. If you see 2 and 20, it means that the baby is healthy. Next is hypercalcemia. Calcium levels are usually between 8 to 10. Anything higher than that is hypercalcemia. And this is dangerous because it can lead to arrhythmias or coma. It's very important to know what is the first line treatment for hypercalcemia. It's IV fluids. If someone has hyponatremia, this is a bit difficult, but I'm going to try and give you a spark note version of hyponatremia. But in theory, first you should always check serum tonicity. So normal tonicity is 275 to 295. So you can be hypertonic if you're above that, isotonic or hypotonic. And then the hypertonic ones are usually due to elevated glucose levels and then the isotonic hyponatremias are usually due to elevated proteins or fat, but the hypotonic, which is less than 275, is where it gets tricky because it subdivides further into uh, fluid status. So you can be hypervolemic, euvolemic, or hypovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia. You know, common differentials for hypervolemic hypotonic hyponatremia would be like CHF, CKD, but then for isotonic, the two main ones would be primary polydipsia or SIADH. And then for hypovolemic would be like diuretics or vomiting. But what I want you to know, if someone has hyponatremia and they're hypovolemic without symptoms, the first line treatment is normal saline. If they have a uh, severe hyponatremia with symptoms and the symptoms of hyponatremia would be like lethargy possibly coma and if sodium level is really low like 120 you want to treat with hypertonic saline three percent if they have euvolemic or hypervolemic hyponatremia the most common one is that you'll see in a question is someone with siadh then the treatment will be water restriction so um, that's kind of like a quick spark notes of what kind of fluid resuscitation you would use. Hypokalemia and hyperkalemia, they both manifest with weakness as their main symptoms. And then if it's hypokalemic, then you want to treat with oral potassium replacement. And then for hyperkalemia, check the EKG because hyperkalemia can present with uh, EKG changes such as peaked T waves and a wide QRS. If you see that, this patient can have an arrhythmia at any moment. So the first thing you want to give is calcium gluconate, which stabilizes the cardiac membranes. And then you can also give insulin, which pushes potassium into the cell. The correct answer with someone with hyperkalemia, potassium over 5, with EKG changes, the first thing is calcium gluconate. Acute bronchitis, this is more of a diagnosis by exclusion. It's mostly caused by a virus but it's different than other lung pathologies because it usually starts with a runny nose and no fever. Whereas the other dangerous ones like pneumonia and stuff won't really have a runny nose and it's more just like a productive cough and fever. So for acute bronchitis, if you rule everything else out, the treatment is just supportive care. Then you should know acute otitis media versus otitis externa versus otitis media with effusion. So acute otitis media is an infection of the middle ear. And then this on otoscopy will show very puffed out, red, erythematous, angry looking eardrum. And then this is caused by the main three bugs, 
uh, strep pneumo, H flu, and Maraxella. Those three are also the main culprits for pneumonia as well, and also for uh, bacterial sinusitis as well. And for meningitis, strep pneumo, H flu are also the main culprits for uh, meningitis. And then the third one would be Neisseria meningitis. For And then that also has a rash, which helps diagnose meningitis. But anyways, back to the ear pathologies. Otitis externa is usually associated with swimmers or diabetics, and the main bug is pseudomonas. For acute otitis media, you want to treat with amoxicillin. Otitis media with effusion is basically in the middle ear. There is fluid bubbles behind the wall, and then this is uh, you treat it supportively. So then MI, there are three drugs you need to remember that decrease mortality, and that's ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and aspirin. You want to use ACE inhibitors indefinitely because it prevents future ischemic events and left ventricular hypertrophy from remodeling after an MI. So the main thing I want to talk about for MI is that if someone has stable angina, which means that the, there's substernal chest pain that's worsened with exertion and relieved with rest, and not getting any worse and it's kind of just every time they exercise they feel chest pain and it gets better this is a stable angina what you want to do next is an exercise stress test which is an exercise ekg if they have contraindications to exercise is it like maybe they've had a hip replacement or they're wheelchair bound and they can't exercise then you can do a pharmacologic stress test but what is more important is when someone presents with an acute onset of chest pain that's happening right now or that has been getting worse. So the first thing you wanna do with someone who comes in with chest pain is you wanna rule out acute coronary syndrome. So the first thing you do is an EKG with troponins. And acute coronary syndrome is defined as three different pathologies. One is unstable angina, the second is n STEMI, and the third is STEMI. So a STEMI is if you have, see ST elevations in two contiguous leads, so the ST segment is raised higher than one millimeter. If you see that, that's automatically a STEMI. You don't even need to wait for the troponins. This person goes straight to cath lab. Or if they have a new left bundle branch block with symptoms of MI, they also go straight to cath lab. And N STEMI and unstable angina are virtually indistinguishable upon presentation. So you need serial troponins to differentiate and you're gonna do the troponins every few hours. And what you do is you treat medically first with Mona C. Bash. So morphine, oxygen, nitrates, aspirin, clopidogrel, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, statin, and heparin. If the serial troponins come back elevated, then this is an n STEMI. If it doesn't, then this is most likely unstable angina. With these two, you want to apply something called a TIMI score. If the TIMI score is between 0 to 2, you do a stress test. If it's 3 or more, then you want to go to the cath lab. How do you apply the TIMI score? Coronary stenosis greater than 50%, age 65 plus, 2 episodes of angina in the last 24 hours, 3 risk factors, for cardiovascular disease such as obesity, smoking, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, etc., greater than three of those, aspirin usage, troponin elevation or ST changes, between zero to two, you're gonna do a stress test. Three or more, they go to the cath lab. Also, the definition of unstable angina, you should know that it's considered chest pain that's been evolving, worsening, or occurs at rest. Because stable angina, when they're at rest, they don't have chest pain, but someone with unstable angina, even at rest, it'll hurt, or the symptoms seem to be worsening. Unstable angina or n STEMI, apply the TIMI score. STEMI doesn't need a TIMI score, straight to cath lab. So I hope that helps. CKD, what is the most likely cause of death from CKD? cardiovascular causes. What about for rheumatoid arthritis? It's also cardiovascular causes because rheumatoid arthritis accelerates atherosclerosis. CKD blood pressure goals is less than 140 over 90. 
Women with diabetes mellitus are associated with getting candidiasis or vaginal yeast infections. And you treat those with azoles. So remember, anyone who has asymptomatic vaginosis in a pregnant woman, so vaginosis is Gardnerella, then you want to treat that with metronidazole because if it's left untreated, it can lead to preterm delivery. Anyone who uses antibiotics and then has vaginal discharge afterwards, think of candida. I kind of think of it as like the C. diff of the vaginal infections. For GI bleeding, hematochesia, if they're stable, the first step is colonoscopy. If they're unstable, you want to give IV fluids and you want to do an EGD because majority of those are from the upper GI. For diverticulitis, you treat it with fluoroquinolones and metronidazole. Diverticulitis will present with left lower quadrant pain, a history of constipation with fever and leukocytosis. It's diagnosed by CT of the abdomen. Ulcerative colitis, remember there's some key associations. It's associated with colon cancer. It also can cause toxic megacolon and it's also associated with primary sclerosing cholangitis. This is very high yield. An older person who presents with the microcytic anemia, which means the MCV is less than 80, and they're anemic, which means the hemoglobin is less than 14 in males or less than 12 in females, the next step is colonoscopy. This is huge. Make sure you remember this. Why do you do the colonoscopy? Because you want to rule out cancer. Uh, Rust-colored sputum is associated with strep pneumo. Legionella is pneumonia plus diarrhea plus hyponatremia, and it's associated with elderly smokers who hang out in areas with dirty air conditioning machines or areas with contaminated sources of water. Inpatient pneumonia is treated with a fluoroquinolone. A healthy person who is treated with pneumonia outpatient for typical pneumonia is treated with amoxicillin. For Outpatient atypical pneumonia, the first line is a macrolide like azithromycin. The difference between typical and atypical pneumonia is based on chest x-ray findings. A typical pneumonia will have lobar consolidation, whereas atypical will have interstitial infiltrates. The most common typical pneumonias are strep pneumo, H. flu, and Maraxella, and the most common atypical pneumonias are mycoplasma, chlamydia, and legionella. How do you decide whether to admit someone to the inpatient hospital for pneumonia is to apply the CURB-65 criteria. Confusion, uremia, respiratory rate that's tachypnic, blood pressure that's hypotensive, and age greater than 65. If they have two or greater of this, then you want to admit them to the hospital. To diagnose depression, M. Sigip caps, mood, sleep, insomnia, guilt, energy, concentration, appetite changes, psychomotor changes, and suicidality. If they have five of the nine symptoms greater than two weeks, then you want to start them first line on an SSRI. And remember that it takes four to six weeks for SSRIs to start working. So if they come in early and they haven't noticed changes yet, tell them to hang in there and be patient before it starts working. And then if they start feeling better to continue it for at least nine months because you don't want to risk them going back into depression. So you keep treating for at least nine months and then reassess later to see if you can wean off the antidepressants. Remember that people who have MI or strokes and have depression after that are three times more likely to die. After giving birth, the endometrium will keep shedding and this is called lochia. And it's normal to see vaginal bleeding with lochia for at least a month. Contraindications to breastfeeding are HIV and chemotherapy. Mastitis is where you see erythema over the breast. It can also look like cellulitis. The first line treatment is dicloxicillin. This is due to cracks in the nipple and when the baby feeds, oral bacteria infiltrates the cracks in the skin. And then an abscess can also look like mastitis, but on palpation, there's fluctuance, which means that it feels like there's fluid underneath. And that's treated with antibiotics and incision and drainage. 
Breastfeeding happens from birth till six months exclusively, and it benefits the baby a lot and prevents it from having infections and allergies later on in life. And also, it's good for the mom and reduces uh, the chances of mom getting certain cancers. CHF, there's four types of heart failure based on the New York Heart Association, class one, two, three, and four. So one is if there's no symptoms, two is if there's symptoms with activity, three, if there's no symptoms only when they're at rest, and four is when there's symptoms at rest. Depending on each class, you wanna treat with different drugs and add different drugs. So for class one, it's an ACE inhibitor. For class two, you wanna add a beta blocker. For class three, you add a diuretic such as spironolactone, and class four is where you can add drugs that increase contractility and inotropy such as digoxin. Remember, there are three heart failure drugs that can improve mortality, and that's an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, and spironolactone, which is a potassium sparing diuretic. So CHF is diagnosed on echocardiogram. If someone has a CHF exacerbation, which means they're suddenly having acute onset of shortness of breath with pulmonary edema, the first line treatment is furosemide, which is a loop diuretic, and that'll help alleviate the blood pressure, and that will help drain out some of the fluid out of the lungs. CHF usually presents with paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea, and that means when they lie down, they feel like they have difficulty breathing. OCPs are contraindicated in migraines with aura, smokers who are 35 years or older because estrogens can increase the risk of DVT, MI, PE, and stroke, and uh, it's prothrombotic. It's contraindicated in these patient populations because it increases the risk of complications. Remember that OCPs protect against ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, but it has a slight increased risk of breast cancer. And then the copper IUD is the most effective form of emergency contraception and can be used within five days of intercourse. However, its main side effect is menorrhagia. So it's contraindicated in patients who have menorrhagia. First line for hypertension are calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, and thiazides. In African Americans, you want to avoid ACE inhibitors as first line, so you want to use thiazides or calcium channel blockers because African Americans are predisposed to angioedema because ACE inhibitors prevent the breakdown of bradykinin and bradykinins are similar to histamine which can cause angioedema. Anyone who has proteinuria, the first line is ACE inhibitors because ACE inhibitors, remember, they cause vasodilation of the efferent arterial and this reduces pressure on the glomerulus and decreases the GFR which is protective and it's not so hard on the glomerular unit. Hypertension is considered anything greater than 140 over 90 on three consecutive visits. This is an indication for starting antihypertensives and if the blood pressure is not reached to the target goal which is under 140 over 90 after one month, then you can increase the dose or add a second drug. In tussusception, which is caused by telescoping of the ileum into the cecum, and then this can cause irritation to the mucosa and possibly ischemia, and this causes the mucosa to slough off, and that produces current jelly stools and colicky pain. So, and it'll most likely be in the right lower quadrant with intermittent abdominal pain, the next step you want to do is an abdominal x-ray to rule out perforation. Intussusception is treated with an air enema. Versus a midgut volvulus, the midgut volvulus is an embryonic pathology where if you remember during embryology, the intestines don't rotate counterclockwise 270 degrees and it twists around the SMA improperly. So basically, the cecum is in the right upper quadrant, and this predisposes to, to twisting around the SMA, and this causes a small bowel obstruction, so the kid will present with bilious vomiting and constant abdominal pain, versus intussusception, 
which has colicky abdominal pain. First thing you want to do is an abdominal x-ray to rule out perforation. And then when you see that it's once you've ruled out perforation, then the next thing you want to do is an upper GI series, which is an x-ray with a barium swallow and it visualizes the esophagus, stomach and duodenum. What you'll see is a double bubble sign with some fluid after the double bubble or something called the corkscrew sign. Jejunal atresia is caused by a vascular accident in utero, mostly associated with maternal cocaine use, and you'll see the triple bubble sign. The double bubble sign is associated with Down syndrome, which is due to the duodenum failing to recanalize. Pneumomediastinum is something that you would see in esophageal perforation, most commonly Borhov syndrome, which is perforation of the esophagus, and it's most commonly caused by endoscopic procedures. Borhovs will present with pneumomediastinum on chest x-ray, but also this patient will have fever and crepitus on palpation of the skin, and you want to diagnose this with gastrographin swallow, which will show the water-soluble dye extravasating out of the esophagus. And you don't want to do an endoscopy because this can make it worse. Once Borhavs is diagnosed, then you treat it surgically. So just to summarize, constant abdominal pain, you should think of mid-gut volvulus. And colicky pain, think of intussusception. Remember, intussusception also has a couple associations. And one is henox shanline purpura can predispose to it. And the second one, the rotavirus vaccine is contraindicated in kids who have had intussusception in the past. So with dementia, make sure before you diagnose dementia to always rule out hypothyroidism or B12 deficiency first. Make sure you rule out all the reversible causes before you make the diagnosis. First line treatment for weight loss is lifestyle modifications such as diet and exercise. And if that doesn't work, then you can progress to Orlistat. In PCOS, you can give metformin to help with weight loss. Bariatric surgery is indicated in patients who have a BMI of greater than 40 or a BMI of greater than 35 with comorbidities. Remember that after bariatric surgery, certain complications are stomal stenosis or dumping syndrome, which is basically the food is transiting through the stomach too quickly and not being absorbed fast enough, and this can cause diarrhea. To treat it, you wanna eat small meals with high protein. Migraine headache, remember the pounds criteria, pulsatile, one day duration, unilateral, nausea and vomiting, and debilitating, but red flags for headaches would be a headache that's getting worse, a headache that increases with Valsalva or exercise, or a headache that was associated with recent head trauma, or a headache that awakens you from sleep. Uh, other than that, then you can diagnose a migraine headache. First line treatment for migraine headache is more conservative, like getting exercise, getting good sleep, less caffeine, less alcohol, and Tylenol PRN. But if it's a severe or refractory migraine, then you want to give sumatriptan, which is the serotonin agonist. And then for migraine prophylaxis, you can give beta blockers or TCAs. So the next is very high yield is knowing what are the four types of patients that get statin therapy. And so the first is any patient at all who has the LDL greater than 190 gets a statin. Any patient with ASCVD, aka atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, those who have peripheral artery disease or coronary artery disease will also get a statin. Any patients older than 40 with diabetes and an LDL greater than 70 also gets a statin. And any patients with the CVD risk greater than 7.5% with the LDL greater than 70 also gets a statin. So those are the four patients that get a statin. Little things to also memorize are that niacin. Niacin is best at increasing HDL and fibrates are best at decreasing triglycerides, but you don't really use any of those as first line. You might use a fibrate if the triglycerides are over a thousand. And remember that super high triglycerides are associated with pancreatitis. But the most common causes of pancreatitis 
are gallstones and alcohol use. So in terms of abuse, any kid who has bruises on the thigh, on the buttocks, on the cheeks, and varying ages, you should suspect abuse. Posterior rib fractures or metaphyseal fractures are also suspicious for abuse and spiral fractures. If you suspect child abuse, try to talk to the child alone without the parents present. And if you really suspect abuse, then what you should do is separate the kid from their parents and admit them to the hospital for further workup. And some of the further workup things you can do are fundoscopy to look for retinal hemorrhages, you can do a bone sur survey to check for more fractures, and you can also call Child Protective Services. So hip conditions, you should know the difference between skiffy and leg cavity perthes disease versus septic arthritis versus transient synovitis. So skiffy is slipped capital femoral epiphysis, and this is usually in an obese 11 year old, and this is where the epiphysis has slipped off. They'll usually show you an x-ray photo, and if you see that it slipped off, they'll usually ask you what to do next, and it's treated with surgical pinning. Versus leg cavity perthes disease, which is idiopathic avascular necrosis of the hip, and this is just treated conservatively. It's usually in a younger, like six-year-old, who's more skinny, and then, Septic arthritis is a very hot and swollen red joint where the patient can't even bear any weight on it, won't move it at all, and it hurts a lot. And the first thing you wanna do is aspirate that joint. The most common bugs are Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes. The favor test is a way to assess for ankylosing spondylitis. It irritates the sacroiliac joint. Faber stands for flexion, abduction, and external rotation. And this is a way to, but if you suspect ankylosing spondylitis on the Faber test, the next step would be to do a lumbar and sacral x-ray, which will show the bamboo patterning. Malignant hyperthermia is caused by calcium accumulating in the muscles due to halothane or succinylcholine, and the treatment is supportive or dantrolene. This should be contrasted with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and serotonin syndrome, which also present with fever and rigidity, but serotonin syndrome would be seen in a patient who's been taking antidepressants, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome would be seen in a patient who's taking antipsychotics, whereas malignant hyperthermia would be seen in a patient who just went under anesthesia. Aspiration pneumonia, people who are at risk for this are people who can't really control their swallow or gag reflex, so it would be like people who have had seizures, people with dementia, people who have had strokes, people who are alcoholics and lose consciousness a lot, or people who are mechanically ventilated. These people are more likely to get aspiration pneumonia. And what you'll see is inflammatory traits in the right lower lobe that can progress to abscesses, which will show air fluid levels and you wanna cover for anaerobes, so you treat this with Zosin, which is Piperacillin Tazobactam, or Clindamycin. Clindamycin covers anaerobes. There's a little trick is that uh, Clindamycin covers anaerobes above the diaphragm, and Metronidazole covers anaerobes below the diaphragm. DVT is when you have a deep venous thrombosis, it'll present with a very tender and swollen calf, and then if you suspect DVT, the first thing you should do is start heparin and then bridge to warfarin. This can also be treated with factor 10A blockers like rivaroxaban. If there's a surgical site infection, the skin around the sutures will be very red and erythematous and the patient will have fever and signs of infection. And what you wanna do is open the wound, clean it out and let it drain and give antibiotics. Respiratory syncytial virus is one of the most common pediatric respiratory diseases and it's usually in kids less than two years old and it starts with upper respiratory symptoms such as nasal congestion and it progresses to a wheezing and a cough and the treatment here is supportive. For adults, normal breathing is anywhere between 12 and 20 breaths per minute 
but for kids less than two years old, anything greater than 40 breaths per minute is tachypnea. Epiglottitis, you should definitely know, caused by H flu and it's vaccine preventable. The kid will usually be drooling and having difficulty breathing and they'll assume the tripod form where they lean over with their palms on their knees to breathe better and stick, they'll also stick their tongue out. And the first thing you wanna do is intubate. That'll usually be the right answer. And then croup is caused by parainfluenza virus. This will present with the barking cough and strider and you want to treat this with corticosteroids or nebulized epinephrine or what they call racemic epinephrine if the child has strider at rest with respiratory distress. So then sometimes croup can advance to something called bacterial tracheitis where their secretions start having more phlegm, they start getting pussy secretions. At this point it's life threatening and you want to intubate them and the bug is most likely Staph aureus. Peritonsillar abscesses, what you'll look for is the deviated uvula and difficulty swallowing. Also, they will have a muffled voice, fever and leukocytosis. What you wanna do is the IND and give antibiotics. Irritable bowel syndrome, just think alternating constipation with diarrhea and improvement after going to the bathroom. If it's diarrhea predominant, you can treat with loperamide. If it's constipation predominant, then you can increase fiber intake. This should be contrasted with celiac disease, which happens in younger patients who will have diarrhea, abdominal pain, and weight loss, but their diarrhea will be bulky, greasy stools. And this is due to malabsorption at the duodenum due to villus atrophy, and this is a reaction to gluten. So they'll have anti-tissue transglutaminase, anti-endomesial or anti-gliadin antibodies, and you wanna treat this by avoiding gluten. So remember that someone who comes in with a cocaine overdose or cocaine toxicity with chest pain, you don't wanna give a beta blocker because in theory, this can cause unopposed alpha vasoconstriction, which can cause an MI. So the first thing you wanna do with cocaine toxicity, even with chest pain, is IV benzodiazepines like lorazepam. People who wanna quit drinking alcohol, the first line drugs are acamprosate and naltrexone. First line for quitting smoking would be a nicotine patch and nicotine gum. And then the next line would be bupropion or varenicline. In tachycardia, you can have a supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. So supraventricular tachycardia happens above the AV node and ventricular happens below the AV node. And on EKG, the supraventricular tachycardias, you'll just see QRST, 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 and the QRS complexes are very narrow. If they're stable, first line is adenosine, and if they're unstable, then it's cardioversion. For VTAC, what you'll see is just repeated QRS complexes, but they look a little bit abnormal. They look kind of like upside down U's and the QRSs will be really wide. So the stable patient will get amiodarone. If they're unstable, then you wanna also cardiovert. High yield bites, you must know between cat bite, a dog bite, and human bite. So a cat bite, a deep puncture wound, it'll most likely be pastorella. Same with the dog bite, and you treat these with augmentin. Whereas a human bite is usually multi-bacterial and it's usually the HASIC organisms like Eichenella and you also treat this with Augmentin. And also people who have human bites should get Hep B and HIV prophylaxis. The difference between TIA and ischemic stroke is TIA uh, has symptoms that resolve within 24 hours whereas stroke the symptoms do not resolve after 24 hours and still remain and stroke can be subdivided into ischemic or hemorrhagic the majority of strokes are ischemic whereas the minority are hemorrhagic it's like 85 percent to 15 percent the greatest risk factor for stroke is hypertension so make sure you remember that you always give tpa within four and a half hours of the stroke so the first thing you want to do with suspected stroke as a head CT without contrast, this is to rule out hemorrhage. 
If they don't have hemorrhage, then you proceed with TPA. If they do have hemorrhage, then this changes your management and you treat hemorrhagic stroke by maintaining blood pressure and keeping it lower so that they don't bleed out more. And the first type of hypertensive drug you wanna use is a calcium channel blocker like nifedipine. After you treat the stroke, then the next thing you wanna do is look for the source. So the three things you wanna order are EKG, an echo, and a carotid Doppler. The carotid Doppler will look for atherosclerosis of the carotid arteries or any narrowing, and this can shoot emboli up into the brain. Um, the echo is to assess for possible heart failure, and it'll also look for thrombi, and EKG is to assess for any arrhythmias or possible MI, which caused the stroke. If you, if you see that there is stenosis of the carotid artery, greater than 70%, the correct answer, the next thing you wanna do is a carotid endarterectomy. HIV is a CD4 deficiency due to the HIV virus, but once it becomes below 200, this is called AIDS. And at 200, this is when you start with prophylaxis and you wanna prevent P. girovecci pneumonia, and you treat this with TMP SMX. If you don't, then they can get P. girovecci pneumonia, which prevents with fever, dry cough, and interstitial infiltrates. HIV, the prodrome, when you first get HIV, it can present a lot like mono with the fever, sore throat, and malaise. But on top of that, this patient will also have a rash. And then at CD450, you want to give MAC prophylaxis, which is prophylaxis against mycobacterium avian complex, and you prophylax with azithromycin. If they talk about ring-enhancing lesions on the brain imaging, think of primary CNS lymphoma, which is seen in AIDS, or toxoplasma, or a brain abscess. But a brain abscess can happen in healthy individuals who have infections on the face like bacterial sinusitis or any type of sinus infection that can invade the brain. What's the pathophysiology for palmar erythema slash spider angiomas in people with liver disease such as cirrhosis? Well, once you have cirrhosis, your liver can't break down estrogen and these increased estrogen levels dilate the blood vessels, and that leads to spider angiomas. Remember that if you have bilirubinuria, bilirubin in the urine can only be found in its conjugated form. You cannot urinate unconjugated bilirubin. Hyperbilirubinemia is anything greater than one. If the direct portion is greater than 20%, then this is called direct hyperbilirubinemia or conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. Below that is unconjugated or indirect hyperbilirubinemia. They're both, they both mean the same things. Anyone with painless jaundice, that's a sign of pancreatic cancer. The most common causes of ulcers are H. pylori or NSAIDs. If someone comes in with symptoms of GERD or gastritis or heartburn, you can start them with empiric proton pump inhibitors but if they're from a foreign country where H. pylori is endemic, then you can start with the H. pylori test. But if they're from the United States, then you start with a proton pump inhibitor and see if it gets better. If it doesn't get better, then you can test for H. pylori or do an endoscopy. Patients with symptoms of GERD, gastritis, heartburn, if they have alarm symptoms, which means they've had dysphagia, or a microcytic anemia, which suggests chronic bleeding or weight loss. These are called alarm symptoms. And in that case, you proceed with endoscopy to look for a possible cancer. People often mix up spicy foods causing ulcers, but that's not true. Spicy foods can make heartburn and indigestion worse and symptoms of GERD worse because the spiciness can irritate the lower esophageal sphincter and people might think that that is causing ulcers because the symptoms are similar, but it doesn't cause ulcers. It just exacerbates heartburn or indigestion. But NSAIDs and H. pylori can definitely cause ulcers. And remember, in an old diabetic woman, 
if she complains of upper abdominal pain, this can be an atypical sign of a heart attack, so you need an EKG. Chronic proton pump inhibitor use is also linked with C. diff and osteoporosis. In a kid who's less than 30 days old with a fever, you should suspect either meningitis or pneumonia, and in this case, you'll treat empirically with ampicillin and gentamicin. And you should know what are the most common bugs for neonates, and that's group B strep, E. coli, and listeria. In adults, the most common causes of meningitis are strep pneumo, H. flu, and Neisseria meningitis, and you would treat them empirically with ceftriaxone and vancomycin. So you need to know that smallpox versus chickenpox, they can both have papules that show up, but smallpox has the same stage of development all across the skin, whereas chickenpox has successive crops of vesicles and papules that are of different ages, and some will be new and some will be ulcerated and crusted over. You need to know the difference between measles and rubella. Measles is also known as rubiola, and rubella is also known as German measles. They present very similarly, they both start with a rash that starts on the head and progresses down to the lower extremities. But the differences are that measles has the four C's, cough, coryza, coplic spots, and conjunctivitis, whereas rubella does not have the four C's and it has arthralgias. Both are vaccine preventable through MMR. Measles can progress to pneumonia or SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a brain infection that happens 10 years later and you treat it with vitamin B6. You need to know the difference between roseola and parvovirus. Roseola is fever that breaks so it ends and then a rash follows, whereas parvovirus is the slap cheek with the lacy reticular rash. Remember that if a pregnant mom gets parvovirus, that the kid, the fetus, is predisposed to high drops fatalis. So for breast masses, if the female is under 30 years old, the next best step is ultrasound. If it's over 30 years old, then the next best step is mammogram. And then any breast mass always has to be biopsied regardless of the imaging results. Um, a unilateral nipple bleeding is suggestive of intraductal papilloma, and you should do a mammogram for that. And remember, mammogram screenings happen age 40 every year. If there's a breast cyst, you want to aspirate it and drain the fluid. If it's yellow and completely drains, then you follow up in a month. If not, then you're going to biopsy. If the fluid is bloody, make sure to send to cytology. PCOS, the first lab test, is a pregnancy test. Remember, PCOS is characterized by anovulation, hirsutism, and obesity, and on ultrasound, there will be multiple cystic follicles of the ovary. And if they are having problems with getting pregnant, the first thing you wanna suggest is weight loss. And then hopefully weight loss will get their periods to normalize. So diabetes is diagnosed by a fasting glucose of over 126, a random glucose of 200 plus with symptoms such as polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, dehydration, weight loss, or a hemoglobin A1c of 6.5. What is considered controlled diabetes? That's if the blood pressure is under 140 over 90, if the A1c is less than 7, and if the cholesterol is less than 100, particularly the LDL. Remember that metformin is contraindicated in kidney disease and CHF because it can cause lactic acidosis. <clears throat> so in terms of low back pain, the majority of causes of low back pain are muscle strain, but some red flags of low back pain would be night pain that's unrelenting, which is suggestive of cancer, pain at rest, or six plus weeks. Know the difference between disc herniation versus spinal stenosis they kind of have opposite presentations. So a disc herniation is worsened with any Valsalva types of maneuvers like sneezing or coughing, and it's improved with extension of the back, like lying down, but worsened with bending forward, and it will cause pain that radiates down the leg. 
whereas spinal stenosis is actually better with uh, flexion and worsened with extension. And sometimes in vignettes, they won't really say it so directly, they'll say it indirectly, like a patient might feel better when they walk uphill, but feel worse when they walk downhill. And that is an indirect way of saying that the pain is worse with extension. And then there's cauda equina syndrome, which is when you have damage to the cauda equina, and this presents with bowel incontinence, urinary incontinence, paresthesias around the perianal area in the legs, and possibly paralysis. And the next best step is to do an MRI and get ready for surgery. And also a herniated disc is diagnosed clinically and you treat it conservatively with NSAIDs and Tylenol for one month. And then if there's no improvement, then you proceed with imaging such as MRI. And remember, anyone who presents with lumbar muscle strain, it's never the right answer to suggest bed rest. It's always better to increase exercise and movement to keep yourself loose. A central tremor is a tremor that increases with movement and is better at rest and it's treated with propanolol and it usually runs in the family. Also, it improves with drinking alcohol. Tourette's is uh, treated with clonidine or guanfacine, which are alpha-2 agonists or atypical antipsychotic. Remember, this person needs to have a motor and vocal tick for greater than a year. Huntington disease is an autosomal dominant disease on chromosome 4. It runs in the family and it causes early onset dementia with movement disorders and it's treated with tetrabenazine. Asthma comes in four flavors, intermittent, mild, moderate, and severe. The intermittent is less than two days a week, mild is three to seven days a week, moderate is every day, and severe is multiple times a day. And the intermittent, you just treat with albuterol PRN, but mild, then you add a low dose steroid, moderate, you add a medium dose steroid, and severe, you add a high dose steroid. To diagnose asthma, you will do a metacholine challenge test, which is a muscarinic agonist, and it narrows the bronchioles, which exacerbates the asthma symptoms, which helps with diagnosis. Remember, acute exacerbation of asthma and COPD have similar treatments with some differences. So they both get oxygen and they both get IV or oral steroids like systemic steroids and bronchodilators, but exacerbation of COPD, you wanna give antibiotics. And you wanna cover for COPD for Pseudomonas and you wanna give them fluoroquinolone. A patient with obstructive sleep apnea Definitely in the vignette, look at the BMI, it'll be over 30 plus. This person ha snores a lot at night with multiple episodes where they wake up in the middle of the night with problems breathing. And throughout the day, they feel very tired and when they wake up, they don't feel like at rest and they might have um, headaches and lethargy and low energy and possibly some signs of mood changes. And then so if you suspect obstructive sleep apnea, the next best step is a sleep study and you treat it with a CPAP. Remember that obstructive sleep apnea untreated can cause right-sided heart failure due to hypoxemic vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arteries. Osteoporosis, the first line treatment is bisphosphonates. The greatest risk factor for osteoporosis is age. Also, the greatest risk factor for breast cancer is also age. So make sure you know what are the greatest risk factors, like on the back of your hand, because they like to ask these things, like what's the greatest risk factor for stroke? Hypertension. What is the first line analgesic for cancer patients? Opioids. What is the first line analgesic for people who have sickle cell crisis? It is also opioids. Studies have shown that people underestimate the pain of sickle cell crisis. Chronic venous insufficiency, look for the medial malleolus ulcer, and then versus CHF, can also have pitting edema of the lower bilateral lower extremities, but in CHF, it'll also include ascites and JVD and signs of heart failure, such as pulmonary edema and possibly 
some heart murmurs. Know the different ear diseases like benign paroxysmal positional vertigo versus Meniere's disease versus vestibular neuritis, which is also known as acute labyrinthitis. So BPPV, this is worse with random movements of the head, like getting up from the bed. It's exacerbated by random movements and you wanna do the Dix Hall Pike maneuver to treat it, which helps get the little stones in the semicircular canals out. Meniere's disease has the triad of tinnitus, hearing loss, and vertigo, and this is due to increased pressure in the endolymph, and you treat it with diuretics. And then vestibular neuritis is, this is hearing loss and vertigo, but it follows a viral upper respiratory tract infection. An umbilical hernia self-resolves. The answer is usually reassure the parent. Unless it's over five years old, then you do surgery. But most of the time, the correct answer is reassure. Remember, on colon cancer screening, if you find a polyp and you remove it, the next time to follow up is three years. Remember, the most dangerous type of polyp is the villus polyp because it sounds like a villain. And that's basically it for family medicine. So I hope that was helpful. And yeah, enjoy your studies and we'll see you in the next one.